Well, hey there, everyone. It's Andrew Franklin, and I am here to talk about confidentiality in Virginia state law, specifically as it relates to providing therapeutic services. I want to first talk about the importance of confidentiality. Maintaining privacy and confidentiality is necessary for a variety of roles that psychologists find themselves in. Some of these roles may include management consultation, psychotherapy, research, and academic settings. Discussions of confidentiality is found in our APA ethics code, and it's also mentioned in Virginia state law, which emphasizes how important it is. The reason why we as clinicians can influence clients so powerfully is because they trust us, and a lot of this hinges on our ability to safeguard information they share. Confidentiality is important to discuss because it is the most common issue to arise within a therapeutic relationship. It could arise in considerations to protect clients from self or doing harm to others. It could arise in considerations to inform parents about work done in session. It could arise when a desire to consult about a client arises. And it could arise when people ask you information about a client. There are numerous instances in which the issue of confidentiality arises. I think it would be helpful if we start off by defining these terms as they have different meanings. Privacy refers to the relationship between the psychologist and the client. It can refer to not even divulging that such a relationship exists outside of the context of the arrangement. Confidentiality speaks to safeguarding information that is disclosed and ultimately gathered by the psychologist in the context of the working arrangement. It includes an ethical and legal obligation that private information is not disseminated to others voluntarily or in response to a formal request unless certain conditions are met. Some exceptions regarding breaking confidentiality is intent to lethally harm self or others, disclosure of child abuse, divulgence of elder abuse, and abuse of disabled individuals. Let's get into a little bit more specifics about confidentiality within a clinical context. Clients are free to discuss any aspect of their treatment with anyone of their choosing, but psychologists must always protect privacy, refuse to acknowledge the identity of their patients and clients, and reveal none of the patient's protected health information. When disclosures are made because the communication has been authorized, psychologists must limit their communication to that information that is germane to the request. For example, when I was working in a university counseling center with a client who was only undergoing treatment as required for their probation, when I was authorized and disclosed to authorities that I had been seeing the client and that they were consistently coming to treatment, I did not share information about diagnosis. I did not disclose information about their childhood or my thoughts on their visible or invisible disabilities or anything else because to do so would be unethical. If I divulged too much information and my client sat down with their parole officer and the officer quipped something deeply personal that I shared, it could jeopardize our therapeutic alliance and increase the likelihood that they did not return to therapy, at least with me. Now, when working with children and adolescents, one must use judgment in what is shared with parents while keeping in mind that parents are legally entitled to know how treatment is going with their child. Suicidal intent and homicidal intent make sense to disclose, but there may be some situations in which you will not disclose with parents what is transpiring or what is said in session. For example, if a minor divulged that they were trying out cigarettes, it may not make the most therapeutic sense to tell mom and dad straightway if there is no risk of significant harm that will compromise their person or if the client just admits that they're going through a phase that they are segueing out of. If adolescents knew that everything they shared in therapy, every detail will be shared with mom and dad, then there may be things that they don't bother to open up to you and I about. Even though parents are legally entitled to know, it may not make the most therapeutic sense to share. Now, if the child was chain smoking cigarettes due to anxiety and fear, and they had a pre-existing condition of asthma, and their behavior seemed very out of the norm for a teenager, then it may make sense to let the child know you needed to share the information, discuss with them the rationale or the why 
in regard to you sharing the information, discuss how they feel about it, discuss that they're willing to collaborate with you on sharing that information and frame all of this within the context of keeping them safe. Now, in an effort to make this practical to the context where you will be training during your graduate school years, I wanna focus on Virginia state law. In terms of Virginia state law, you should navigate to Title 12, Agency 35, and the two chapters that will be most salient to you while you work in Virginia as a practicum student or otherwise uh, will be 105 and 115. For the purposes of our conversation on confidentiality, 105 talks about confidentiality as it relates to personnel records, but we need to go to 115 section 80, which focuses on confidentiality in the part that covers explanation of individual rights and provider duties. I want to cover Title 12, Chapter 115, Section 80 in its entirety here. Uh, we'll start with provider duties, and I want you to think of yourself as the provider as we discuss law, Virginia state law, around confidentiality. Um, so the provider's duties involve the following. Providers maintain the confidentiality of any information that identifies an individual. If an individual's services record pertains in whole or in part to referral, uh, diagnosis, or treatment of substance use disorders, providers shall disclose information only according to applicable federal regulations. Uh, this includes verbal information, you all, as well as information in graphic form related to records. Uh, providers obtain and document in the individual services record the individual's authorization or that of the authorized representative prior to disclosing any identifying information about him. So uh, authorizations, what's being spoken of here are releases of information. These are documents that clients sign in which they authorize the extent to which the provider can share information with others, what information will be shared. Uh, sometimes in these releases of information, well, I'd say most cases there is an expiration date uh, and there are other parameters listed that I'll go over in short order. So think of authorizations as releases of information, uh, which should be distinguished from authorized representatives. Uh, so legal authorized representatives can be a person or an organization that is legally permitted to make decisions for another person. It could be because they're incapacitated or they have an intellectual disability or a developmental disability uh, that impacts their judgment, their ability to carry out everyday living activities, and thus they have a legally authorized representative to, to make decisions on their behalf. Okay, um, LARs are sometimes called surrogate consent or surrogate decision makers. Um, there are elements that releases of information must contain. Uh, the Virginia Code provides specifics as to what the authorization should entail, uh, which briefly includes who disclosures should be made to, so I mentioned that earlier, the nature of the information being disclosed, effective date, and appropriate signatures about whom the information is being shared or um, appropriate signatures from the LAR or the legally authorized representative. Um, it is our responsibility as providers to tell each individual and his authorized representative about how, excuse me, about the individual's confidentiality rights. Um, this shall include how information can be disclosed and how others might get information about the individual without his authorization. If a disclosure is not required by law, the provider shall uh, give strong consideration to any objections from the individual or his authorized representative in making the decision to disclose information. Uh, so we're always striving to safeguard clients' records, clients' information, and when we're not required by law to disclose, like we want to object to disclosures being made. An example of this um, is asserting privilege on behalf of a client if an attorney is trying to subpoena a client's records. Okay. Providers shall prevent unauthorized disclosures of information from services records and shall maintain and disclose information in a secure manner. Um, so in a secure manner, this may speak to um, processes entailing restricted networks, encrypted files, uh, HIPAA compliant software, um, especially if you're engaging in telehealth. So along those lines, providers want to strive to make sure that they are 
um, safeguarding client information that is on paper, that is electronic, that is spoken in the session, like how are you going to go about maintaining privacy? Some providers get voice machine, um, noise machines that they put outside of their office, white noise machines. I mean, we, we really have to take a comprehensive approach to uh, respecting a client's privacy. In the case of a minor, the authorization of the custodial parent or other person authorized to consent to the minor's treatment under 54.1-2969 is required, but there are a few exceptions. So, so basically, this part of the law is saying, hey, in most cases, custodial parent must give consent, a legally authorized representative must give consent for the minor, but there's a few exceptions in Virginia state law that we should be mindful of. So let's go through some of those. These exceptions include the disclosure of information related to medical or health services for a sexually transmitted or contagious disease, family planning or pregnancy, and outpatient care, treatment or rehabilitation for substance use disorders, mental illness, or emotional disturbance. There are two instances in which minor and custodial parent must authorize disclosure of information together. Um, they include the following. The concurrent authorization of the minor and custodial parent is required to disclose inpatient substance abuse records. Um, the minor and the custodial parent shall authorize the disclosure of identifying information related to the minor's inpatient psychiatric hospitalization when the minor is 14 years of age or older and has consented to admission. All right. So a few, few exceptions there. Now, I wanted to make sure we're pointed out. Um, if you as a provider disclose identifying information, you must attach a statement that informs the person receiving the information that it must not be disclosed to anyone else unless the individual authorizes the disclosure or unless state law or regulation allows or requires further disclosure without authorization. Providers may encourage individuals to name family members, friends, and others who may be told of their presence in the program and general condition or well-being. Except for information governed by 42 CFR Part 2, providers may disclose to a family member, other relative, a close personal friend, or any other person identified by the individual information that is directly relevant to that person's involvement with the individual's care or payment for his health care if, so there's some contingencies here, the provider obtains the individual's agreement, the provider provides the individual with the opportunity to object to the disclosure, and the individual does not object or the provider reasonably infers for the circumstances based or, based or the exercise of professional judgment that the individual does not object to disclosure. Uh, if the opportunity to agree or object cannot be provided because of the individual's incapacity or an emergency circumstance, the provider may, in the exercise of professional judgment, determine whether the disclosure is in the best interest of the individual, and if so, disclose only the information that is directly relevant to the person's involvement with the individual's health care. Um, so you all should be seeing a trend here where there's a focus on what information is relevant to the matter at hand and not divulging any more than that. There are a few situations that allow providers to disclose information and they typically involve emergencies, prioritization of time sensitive treatment, historical research, and legal proceedings. So these are typically for purposes of receiving payment or, or continuity of treatment and civil litigation in the form of malpractice involving the provider. And there are other situations based on one's role in providing mental health services and engagement in research. Providers may disclose the following identifying information without authorization or violation of the individual's confidentiality, but only under the conditions specified in the following subdivisions of this subsection. Providers should always consult 42 CFR Part 2, confidentiality of alcohol and drug abuse patient records, if applicable, because these federal regulations may prohibit some of the disclosures addressed in this section. So 
again, you all, this is the part of the law as it relates to confidentiality, where we find that there are a lot of exceptions to confidentiality and, and uh, when we ultimately break it. However, in the course of your clinical interviews for therapy or your, your intakes as it relates to assessment, um, you are not going to be spelling out all of these reasons for confidentiality that we're going to go over. Some of them are just simply um, not relevant to the matter at hand. Some of these things uh, may not necessarily crop up. So when the time comes for you to have discussions about these exceptions, you, you can. Um, you could very well take the entirety of the intake session talking about the exceptions of confidentiality. As you all know, you can't spend the entire intake talking about exceptions to confidentiality. So you focus on the really, really important ones so that you can go about building rapport and asking the right questions to get a handle on um, diagnosis and how you could potentially treat them. OK, so with that being said, let's go over the many exceptions <laughs> um, to, to confidentiality. Um, let's start with the first one, emergencies. Emergencies. Providers may disclose information in an emergency to any person who needs that particular information for the purpose of preventing injury to or death of an individual or other person. The provider shall not disclose any information that is not needed for this specific purpose. Providers may permit any full time or part time employee, consultant, agent or contractor of the provider to use identifying information or disclose to another provider, a health plan, the department or a community service board or CSB information required to give services to the individual or get payment for services. All right. So that speaks to uh, providers releasing information as a means of getting compensated from insurance companies and other scenarios that don't involve uh, compensation, but really uh, emphasize client treatment. Um, court proceedings. If the individual or someone acting for him introduces any aspect of his mental condition or services as an issue before a court, administrative agency or medical malpractice review panel, the provider may disclose any information relevant to that issue. The provider may also disclose any records if they are properly subpoenaed, if a court orders them to be produced, or if involuntary admission or certification for admission is being proposed. Um, again, usually when records are subpoenaed, you assert privilege, you go back, you have a conversation with your client, and then you let the client kind of have the final say in regard to the release of records. If, if records are being court ordered, then there is no asserting privilege. You have to pro provide those records, but still you can very much hold to APA ethical principles by having conversations with the client about how you have to release that information based on law, um, just as a means of, again, like trying to make sure that they feel some sense of um, ownership in the process. It ultimately is their information. Uh, you don't want your rapport with them to be jeopardized that they found out secondhand that you released those records. Um, so uh, that what is what typically should be done in that scenario. And in regard to involuntary omission or certification for omission is being proposed. And in cases when involuntary omission is taking place, then that person's judgment, that person's decision making, like that is obviously a bit off in terms of how they normally function. And thus you wouldn't be able to like have a, a, a full length conversation with them about the extent to which uh, you they want you to disclose records. So it makes sense that uh, you would simply be providing information as a means to safeguard their well being, because in terms of our ethics and what matters most, like their safety and their well-being matters most in that situation. Uh, legal counsel. Providers may disclose information to their own legal counsel or to anyone working on behalf of their legal counsel and providing representation to the provider. Providers of state operated services may disclose information to the office of the attorney general or to anyone appointed by or working on behalf of that office and providing representation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, so if, if there's some type of civil suit that's filed against the psychologist, 
then be because there is litigation around services provided, the psychologist is in their right to be able to share records uh, with attorneys and those involved in the proceedings as a means of um, talking about the nature of their work with the person that is suing them. Um, human rights committees, providers may disclose to the LHRC and the SHRC any information necessary for the conduct of their responsibilities under these regulations. Um, others authorized or required by the commissioner, such as CSB or private program director. Um, so individuals can receive disclosures by providers for the following activities. And this is without consent. Um, so licensing, human rights or certification or accreditation reviews, hearings, reviews, appeals, or investigations under these regulations, evaluation of provider performance and individual outcomes, statistical reporting, pre-authorization, utilization reviews, financial and related administrative service reviews and audits, uh, similar oversight and review activities. Uh, this is another exception to confidentiality. Uh, Pre-emission screening, services, and discharge planning. So providers may disclose to the department, the community service board, or to other providers information necessary to screen individuals for admission or to prepare and carry out a comprehensive individualized services or discharge plan. And there's a specific code in the Code of Virginia that speaks to this. Um, protection and advocacy agency. Providers may disclose information to the protection and advocacy agency in accordance with that agency's legal authority under federal and state law. Uh, it, here's a bit of interesting code for those on, on the research side of things that may want to potentially do some qualitative research as it relates to certain populations in state hospitals, in partial hospitalization programs, et cetera. Um, there is something specifically that addresses historical research. So providers may disclose information to persons engaging in bona fide um, historical research if all the following conditions are met. The request for historical research shall include, at a minimum, a summary of the scope and purpose of the research, a description of the product to result from the re research and its expected date of completion, a rationale explaining the need to access otherwise private information, and the specific identification of the type and location of the records sought. So usually when people are, um, at least from my experience, going about historical research as it relates to mental health data, they're usually a part of the organization in which they're trying to get these archival records. For example, Eastern State Hospital um, allows practicum students to go about analyzing data uh, from um, individuals that are currently not receiving care, of course, like it's usually a request made from inside the organization. I imagine that they're out there, there may be some um, opportunities or uh, folks seizing opportunities rather to request information and they're not necessarily a part of the institution from which they're requesting. I imagine that conversation of getting data, it's easier when you're inside. Um, so, um, let's move on a little bit more about um, conditions being met. So uh, whether you're inside or outside, you have to make sure that you're clearly identifying what you want, your rationale for it, the, the type and location of the records, et cetera. Uh, number two, uh, the commissioner, the CSB executive director or private program director has authorized the research. The individual or individuals who are the subject of the disclosure are deceased. So that is key they're deceased. Uh, there are no known living persons permitted by law to authorize the disclosure, and the disclosure would in no way reveal the identity of any person who is not the subject of the historical research. All right, so there's several safeguards that are in place to prevent uh, 
to, to one, ensure that if people are still alive, they have a right to decide if information about their PHI is being used in research. And uh, if that person isn't alive, then anybody connected to them has a right to assent or decline. And then if all of that falls through, then there still needs to be these safeguards around the type of information that's being sought and clear explanation in regard to how that information would be used. Let's move on to some more exceptions of confidentiality. Um, protection of public safety. If an individual receiving services makes a specific threat to cause seriously, serious bodily injury or death to an identified or readily identifiable person and the provider reasonably believes that the individual has the intent and the ability to carry out the threat immediately or imminently, the provider may disclose those facts necessary to alleviate the potential threat. Inspector General, providers may disclose to the Office of the State Inspector General any individual services records and other information relevant to the provider's delivery of services. Virginia Patient Level Data System, providers may disclose financial and services information to Virginia Health Information as required by law. Let's talk a little bit about the disclosure of psychotherapy notes. Providers shall obtain an individual's authorization for any disclosure of psychotherapy notes, except when disclosure is made for the provider's own training programs in which students, trainees, or practitioners in mental health are being taught under supervision to practice or improve their skills in group, joint, family, or individual counseling. All right, so even if a provider elects to take notes, take ISPs or individual service plans or other types of treatment plans and bring it into classroom settings, laboratories, practicum team meetings, whatever the case may be, there still is a responsibility of that provider to make sure that they sanitize that information and uh, make sure that the information that is provided will not provide enough clues or information that will lead to somebody being identified. So that's really important there. Um, two, to defend the provider or its employees or staff against any accusation or wrongful conduct. Um, so again, this kind of speaks to civil lit litigation and um, how psychotherapy notes uh, can be used to defend one's stance, the nature of one's work in the court of law. In discharge of the provider's duty in accordance with 54.12400.1b of the Code of Virginia to take precautions to protect third parties from violent behavior or other serious harm. Um, all right, so we're still talking about this, the disclosure of psychotherapy notes, okay, um, exceptions. Um, these notes can be disclosed as required in the course of an investigation, audit, review, or proceeding regarding a provider's conduct by duly authorized law enforcement, licensure, accreditation, or professional review entity, or uh, when otherwise required by law. Okay. All right. Um, still talking about exceptions to confidentiality. Um, law enforcement is mentioned uh, as a party in which exceptions to confidentiality can be made. Um, these are some of the circumstances in which a provider would breach confidentiality. One, pursuant to a search warrant or grand jury subpoena. Two, in response to their request for the purpose of identifying or locating a suspect, fugitive, an individual required to register with uh, Sex Offender and Crimes Against Minors Registry Act, material witness, or missing person. And um, this disclosure is okay by law as only at as long as the only information that is disclosed is the following. 
the name and address of the individual, the date and place of birth of the individual, the social security number of the individual, the blood type of the individual, date and time of treatment received by the individual, date and time of death of the individual, description of distinguishing physical characteristics of the individual, and type of injury sustained by the individual. Regarding the death of an individual for the purpose of alerting law enforcement of the death, if the healthcare entity has a suspicion that such death may have resulted from criminal conduct, or if the healthcare entity believes in good faith that the information disclosed constitutes evidence of a crime that occurred on its premises. All right, so in learning about confidentiality, um, oftentimes instructors will lean to the extreme example to really emphasize the importance of privacy by, by providing an example and saying, if somebody walks into your office and confesses to murdering someone, like you are required by law, according to your ethics, you cannot share any of that information. I think here, based on this law that we're reviewing, there there are um, clearly some exceptions that can be made, right? Um, if the murder happened on your mental health property, heaven forbid, <laughs> that is grounds to disclose some information to, to the authorities. Um, and there's other exceptions that, that lend itself um, to, to disclosure, as I talked about, such as search warrants and the, the need to have folks registered. And, and man, do we get into some, some detail in terms of identifying the type of information that you would actually provide to law enforcement, okay? That's why it's good to know these exceptions, right? And again, these are exceptions that you're not gonna roll out to your client in the intake interview because it's, it's just too much. And, um, you have a lot of ground to cover already as it relates to the intake interview. Um, and the spirit of it being too much, we got a few more exceptions to go, folks, and then we'll be done. Um, moving on from law enforcement, other statutes or regulations, providers may disclose information to the extent required or permitted by any other state or law or regulation. See also 32.1, 127.1, colon 03 of the Code of Virginia for a list of circumstances in which records may be disclosed without authorization. Um, so there's more, there's always more folks. Um, upon request, the provider shall tell the individual or his authorized representative the sources of information contained in his services record and provide a written listing of disclosures of information made without authorization, except for disclosures to, so, all of these exceptions that we've kind of gone through as it relates to confidentiality are important to keep in mind. And if you as a provider are in a situation where you're disclosing information, there needs to be a written log of who you've disclosed to, why you've disclosed to them. Like there needs to be a written record of that because uh, the individual could request that record and be granted it. A legally authorized representative could request that record, right? And um, and you may need it outside of client care. You just may need it in terms of like really supporting the fact that you're providing ethical services and you're just not being willy nilly about disclosing information. All right. Um, so these would be a written listing of disclosures of information made without releases of information, except for disclosures, <laughs> excuse me, to employees of the department, community service board, the provider or other providers, to carry out treatment, payment, or health care operations that are incidental or unintentional disclosures that occur as a byproduct of engaging in health care communications and practices that are already permitted or required. So just a quick note there, you all. Even though we are really advanced with our technology and we have all of this HIPAA compliant software and all of these encrypted files and such, like hackers out there are really skilled 
Sometimes due to human error, mistakes happen. Information is shared with parties in which it shouldn't be shared. Um, getting back to hackers, I mean, organizations hire hackers to hack into their system so that they can buttress their defense against people that want to maliciously hack their system. So all of this to say that um, even with uh, whatever software you're using or with whatever strategies you're taking to safeguard client information, there's always the possibility that that information is going to end up in the hands of the wrong parties. OK, um, you want to do what you can to limit that from occurring. But that is a possibility. If that were to happen, then you don't necessarily have to list that in your disclosure list of folks that you shared information with without receiving informed consent. To an individual or his authorized representative pursuant to an authorization for national security or intelligence purposes. Okay, so if the FBI and CIA <laughs> get involved in uh, what you're doing on the, the big leather couch, chewing tobacco like Sigmund Freud, like if they, if they get involved, then you don't have to include that in your listing. Um, so correctional institutions or law enforcement officials or uh, that were made more than six years prior to the request. All right. Um, the provider shall include the following information in the listing of disclosures of information provided to the individual or his authorized representative under subdivision nine of this subsection. This is the information that you would need to include the name of the person or organization that received the information and the address, if known, a brief description of the information disclosed a brief statement of the purpose of the, of the disclosure or in lieu of such a statement, a copy of the written request for disclosure. That is the information that you need to include. So you're not just going to have a running list. You're going to have like a very kind of de detailed listing of kind of purpose when you made the disclosure, frequency, all of that. If the provider makes a disclosure to a social service or protective services agency about an individual who the provider reasonably believes to be a victim of abuse or neglect, the provider is not required to inform the individual or his authorized representative of the disclosure if A, the provider in the exercise of professional judgment believes that informing the individual would place the individual at risk of serious harm, or B, the provider would be informing the authorized representative and the provider reasonably believes that the authorized representative is responsible for the abuse or neglect and that informing such person would not be in the best interest of the individual. All right, you all. So what we're talking about here is using your clinical judgment when you're in situations that involve child abuse and neglect. If mom and dad, you suspect, are the initiators, the perpetrators of the child abuse and neglect, and you're making a call to the Department of Social Services about this child abuse so that there can be an investigation that occurs outside of you, um, an investigation which will does not involve you deciding if or when or how or to what extent it's factual, that's something that happens outside of you, right? Usually what happens in those like scenarios is when when there are um, allegations or suspicions or disclosures of child abuse that have come up, you usually have a conversation with kind of parents and um, you let them know that you're a mandated reporter and you're doing this in the spirit of maintaining the rapport and alliance because you want to continue to work with the family, um, especially if the child abuse is um, not something that's happening within the household. There are instances, though, where you have to use your judgment and that if um, mom, dad or the perpetrators like you may not go to them and say, hey, I'm calling Department of Social Services child abuse. Um, if you think that mom, dad that's perpetrating abuse is going to put the victim at increased harm of suffering abuse once more. Right. Or dealing with even more neglect. Um, so personal judgment has to be used in 
those specific situations. And uh, I guess I will end with this final slide. Um, this is just a final slide that goes through some practical general considerations around confidentiality. Um, not sharing client information with partners, loved ones, and friends is key, and this may entail some modification to how one would normally come home and talk about how their day went, because remember, you have to safeguard client privacy. Um, and then there's some other considerations that are um, listed here as well, many of which I've already talked about. So if you got nothing from this presentation, I hope what you got was the sense of we really have responsibility on a legal front, especially in the state of Virginia, the safeguard PHI. There's a lot of different ways we can safeguard PHI. And uh, even though in your confidentiality spill, like you hit on a few key reasons why you can break confidentiality without consent, there are in actuality, according to law, a lot of reasons why you may be disclosing information. And um, in those instances, when you're disclosing information without consent, you want to make sure that you're doing it according to law. You want to make sure that your record keeping is up to par, that you're keeping a record of um, the, the times in which you have uh, breached confidentiality. Um, you want to make sure that when you're sharing information, you're also attaching a document with that information, letting the recipient know that they should not be sharing that information with someone else. This is, this is all important in terms of ethical practice, sound legal practice as a clinical psychologist. Okay. So this has been a presentation of the code as it relates to confidentiality. Um, of course, you can peruse it of your own accord, but we have literally gone through it to the letter, okay, with my commentary interspersed in there. Um, hope that this was helpful, and uh, I look forward to a next video presentation, which I will try to make significantly shorter. Bye.